Well, today, um, what we're going to do is talk about a subject we've never approached in this class before. And actually, this was originally, this, this, this particular talk is a little bit technical. I originally wrote this for medical students, okay? But um, as I was preparing it, um, the, the implications for the Bible, the implications for what is communicated in Scripture were so strong. I said, you know, this is really, man, I mean, it kind of provides backup support for something the Bible has said a long time ago. And uh, it's so striking that I, I, had to, I had to put it into a talk. So you guys are kind of guinea pigs. <laughs> I, uh, it's, it's not really for general audiences, but I'm hoping what I've tried to do is to put it in ways that, um, that other people can understand because it's, it's kind of cool that now we understand why the Bible said something that it did 2,000 years ago, and now we see why, it was, why it's so relevant. And specifically deals with the subject of being idle. Um, you know, throughout the Old Testament and definitely in the New Testament, um, the apostles are kind of hard on people that aren't doing anything. And um, we now know that if, we, if you don't have goals, if you're not pursuing any goals at all, it's bad for us. And we have a country now that is divided into people who are doing stuff and people that aren't doing stuff, you know, and it's like it's this whole concept of being idle. Uh, the idea, the number of people who are being idle is very high in the, across the world today. And it has negative effects, uh, both medically, psychologically, and spiritually. And we're kind of going to uh, briefly go into those. So hopefully as we go through this, it'll continually, it'll make sense to you as, as we go through uh, this particular uh, talk. You're familiar with the Human Genome Project, where we figure out what normal genes are supposed to be present in humans. We now know that there are about 25 to 30,000 genes uh, in, the human, in the human DNA. We have 4 billion base pairs, about 30,000 genes. There is something called the Human Connectome Project that's going on, where we're figuring out how the brain is supposed to work normally. And the brain, if you, if you will, the brain is like, think about a map of the United States with major airports distributed across the country. Like if you want to go anywhere, you fly between major airports and then you take a smaller airport to your location if it's in a smaller town. Well, the brain is like that, where you have seven large hubs and that, that's your main communication and then you have smaller, smaller areas that go to the other areas. Well, those hubs are what we're matching, what we're, what we're mapping, and that's called the connectome. So here we see them, the default mode network, executive control, visual, spatial, sensory motor, frontal parietal, auditory, and temporal parietal. Those are the major hubs in the brain. And activity between these hubs determines whether you have a brain that's functioning normal or whether there is disease. People with certain uh, psychiatric maladies have problems in the connection between these hubs. Now, th th these are called uh, goal-directed goal -directed networks. In other words, your brain is focusing on a particular task before these are activated. Now, how do we know uh, when these things are activated? Through something called functional neuroimaging. With functional MRI, uh, when you are under, in the machine, when you think a particular thought or try to do a task, we can see which areas are lighting up, which areas are metabolically active, where the electricity is going. And so we can map what you're thinking based on the electrical patterns that are being produced by the brain. So, yeah? Can they tell if that's a positive or negative thought? Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Um, default mode network is the one that you use when you're doing nothing. When you're staring off into space and letting your mind wander, default mode is active, okay? Now for humans, this is the most active thing that you do, <laughs> okay? Humans use default me mode network more than anything. It uses 40% more energy than all of the other areas, okay? It is the number one thing that humans do is default mode. Now, um, this basically shows the di all the different ones active. It's separated by different colors. Here's default mode down here. The areas of the brain that are turned on when you are letting your mind wander are the medial prefrontal cortices. Here you see the inferior um, uh, uh, cingulate cortex back there and inferior parietal. Uh, this is a blow up. 
and just showing you a global map of when you are sitting around letting your mind wander, not thinking, just letting the, mind, letting the thoughts flow through your mind, not directed anywhere, these are the areas that light up. The medial prefrontal cortex, posterior singlet, precuneus, inferior parietal areas, and what's not shown is the uh, uh, temporal, temporal lobe as well. Okay? Now, why is this important? This default mode, again, is not focused on any particular task. This is what is active when you are allowing thoughts to just wander into your head. Now, I'm going to say right now that when you do that, your thoughts automatically turn to self. The areas that are active are areas that are all about you. Okay? God made us to be a little bit selfish. That's our natural state. Why is it? Because God is pro-life. He doesn't want you to frivolously throw your life away. He wants you to think about how you can better yourself, how you can avoid danger and stuff like that. So because he made us with self-preservation, he caused default mode to be a little bit selfish. Okay? Well, a lot of bit selfish. <laughs> now, how much time you spend in default mode, the more time you spend in default mode, the worse it is for you, okay? It's not good to spend extra time in default mode. You can't avoid spending any time in it. But if we have too much time in default mode, there are negative consequences. So I mentioned those areas of the brain that are active when you're doing default mode. So I'm going to go through what each of these areas principally do. Okay? They have many functions, but there are some big functions that they are famous for. Okay, we're going to start, here you see all of them, anterior singlet, medial prefrontal, posterior singlet, and then down here, the medial temporal lobe. And all of these do different things. For example, start with the posterior cingulate cortex. Okay, here's a, here's a cross section of a brain. Here's the person's nose. There's where their eye goes. All right, over here, this is where your ear is about. This is the posterior cingulate cortex. This particular area, when you are thinking about yourself, about what your history has been, what your likes are, when you're thinking about your autobiography. This is the area of the brain that you access. It's all about me. You know, what do you like? What do you not like? Uh, what, what's your favorite color? Uh, what, what school did you go to? You know, who was your 10th grade teacher? What are your plans? This, it's all about you. So if you were going to write a book about yourself, you would be activating the posterior cingulate cortex all the time because it's focused on you, specifically when you access biographical information about yourself. Now, the next one, the precuneus, okay, we just talked about this area here. This is the posterior cingulate cortex. Here's the precuneus here between the occipital lobe and the frontal lobe. This is in the parietal area. Well, this is the, this is the, the, the parietal lobe, actually, uh, but the precuneus is part of it. The precuneus is responsible for another area that's kind of selfish. Specifically, it's involved in comparison. So when you see something, when you see another person or watch another person's activity, the precuneus compares you to them. Hmm, his porch is dustier than mine. I'm a better housekeeper, okay? Hmm, you know, I have more weeds than they do. That's not good, okay? So basically, this is the part of the brain that compares you to other people. So when you look at what you see and then you make a comparison, how does that compare with me? Now, the anterior cingulate cortex, again, here's the cross-section of the brain. Here's the eyeball and the nose. Here's the anterior. The corpus callosum is right here. That's what connects the two halves of the brain together. The anterior cingulate cortex, this is a very, very big area, okay? By big, I mean that it plays a very, very, very important role. The anterior cingulate cortex, what it does... I mean, I talk about this in my office all the time because people with anxiety disorders have overactive anterior cingulate cortex. The anterior cingulate cortex looks into your memory banks. It looks throughout your brain, and it asks two questions. Number one, is there a threat coming down the road in my future? Is there a potential threat for me that I need to be dealing with right now? Am I dealing with it? If the answer is yes, it lets me relax. This is okay. You're taking steps. It's out there, but you're taking steps. Is there a reward that you're supposed to be pursuing? Okay, if you plan on going to college and you haven't filled out any forms, 
You know, get what's wrong with you. It's not going to let you. It's going to make you restless. If there's something that you're supposed to be doing, then it's not going to. It's going to. It's going to bother you. Okay. The, now, again, some people, um, you know, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> okay. And some people, it works too well, and it won't shut up. People with severe OCD, we literally have to put electrodes in there to turn that sucker off because it just wants to go boogity boogity all day long. Okay. That, and so the anterior cingulate cortex is the executive secretary of the brain. Okay, if, if there's something, she knows everybody else's job in the brain. Okay, she knows what the prefrontal cortex is supposed to be doing. She knows what's happening in auditory association. She knows all this stuff. And if somebody's not doing their job, she lets you know by bothering you. And so when she is active, you're not feeling very good. You're feeling stressed. Okay, you're feeling restless. And she controls how restless you are, depending on what you're doing. If you've got threats coming down the pike, or if you've got stuff you're supposed to be pursuing and you're not, she bothers you. All right? The anterior cingulate cortex. Now, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex works together with the, oh boy, uh, the subgenual cingulate cortex. They, they work, bottom line, it works together to be the stressometer. Okay, I mentioned the anterior cingulate cortex giving you that feeling of irritation, feeling of restlessness. When it comes to overt anxiety, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex determines whether you feel st relaxed or uber stressed. Okay? This particular area of the brain regulates that. If for example, it works together with that executive secretary that I just mentioned. Okay, these two guys, they, they do work, they interact a lot. And they determine, and this is the principal area, right, that ventromedial prefrontal cortex determines just how stressed out you are going to be on a scale of 1 to 10. Should this be a 10 out of 10, or is this a 1 out of 10? Now, when you, if you, I, I use this example all the time in my office. You know, if you walked in your house one day, and there on the carpet, there was a coiled rattlesnake about to strike. Immediately. Your amygdala would light up with full emotion and it would want to do a 10 out of 10. And your ventral medial prefrontal cortex would assess the threat and say, yup, 10 out of 10, and let that through unfiltered, okay? All right, that's what would happen. Now, what if it was a dried up dead worm on the carpet? Well, your amygdala goes off and it's still 10 out of 10, but you don't get to feel that because immediately the ventral medial prefrontal cortex assesses the threat and says, ah, ah, wait a minute, number one, it's dead. Number two, it's on the carpet, dried up, it won't even make a mess, <laughs> okay? And it takes the threat level from 10 to a one, boom. Maybe a two if you're really tidy, okay? <laughs> All right, but boom, it does that. So you don't even feel the 10 out of 10. So this is the area of the brain that reduces your, that controls how stressed you should feel about a thing. Now, the medial temporal lobe, bottom line, that's your memory banks, okay? That's where you access long-term and immediate recall and, and long-term memories. That, that's where you, you get that hippocampus and amygdala, that, that whole area. And so this is, if you're going to, wait, think about this, you're in default mode. Default mode, your mind is wandering. What's it wandering through? It's wandering through your memory banks. It's going through your memory banks, okay? So you're in default mode. Your mind is wandering. You're taking a stroll through your library of memories, okay? And you're looking at the books. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now, the books that are going to get your attention are the biggest, fattest books with the coolest fonts. And those are the ones with emotional charges. So as you're going through those books, you're looking for keywords that have emotion. You're looking, and so those are the ones that you pull off the shelf, the ones that have emotional charges. Now, here's the thing. The biggest books are negative emotions. As you go through memory lane, the negative emotions stand out way more than the positive emotions. Why is that? Because negative emotion or negative experiences cause twice as much electricity in your brain as positive emotion. And the question is, why did God do that? Why would he make it so that negative things, bad things, generate bigger electrical responses in your brain than positive things? Wouldn't life be better if he hadn't done that? Okay, I mean, but he did it that way. He made it so that if something bad happens to you, you have these big electrical charges and it makes a bigger memory, okay? Now, the inferior parietal cortex, this particular area of the brain, is involved in 
about how you, it, it's always asking the question, how do I feel right now? How do I feel right now? Okay? How do I feel? Am I happy? Am I sad? Am I too hot? Am I too cold? Am I sweating a little bit? You know? How about my feet? Are my socks too tight? Okay? Is there a tag on my underwear? It's that kind of thing. Okay? And it's specifically, it's taking, it, it's, it's assessing all the stuff that's coming in through my thalamus, and it's all, all my sensory stuff, and it's, regurg and it's, it's reflecting on all my sensory material and asking the question, how do I feel right now? All right, so to sum it up, this is what's going on in my default mode network. When I'm allowing my thoughts to wander, I'm focusing on my biography. I'm asking myself, how do I feel? I'm comparing myself to the other people that I look at and see. I'm looking out for what problems are out there that could hurt me in the future, that could make me feel uncomfortable perhaps, okay? And it's all about going through my, my library, looking at all the bad stuff. This is what I ruminate on when I'm in default mode network. It's, as you can see, it's a little bit selfish, okay? But that's what default mode network does. Default mode network gets 40% it's 40 more blood than any other areas of the brain, all right? It's very hungry, and we use it a lot. It takes a lot of energy and lots of blood. Now, when we shift our mind, to do something specifically, to do a particular task, it turns the default network off. Okay, so when I redirect my attention to do something specifically specific, I turn default me me network off. Okay, now what happens if I spend too much time in default mode network? You don't get anything done. You don't get anything done. And that the default mode network, your thoughts become more rigid. It gets harder to pull out of it. Okay, yeah. Is there a relation between the default mode network and what they call children that have attention deficit disorder or adults? Yeah, there is a relationship, in, yeah, with people with ADD or adults with attention deficit disorder, yeah, do have difficult time pulling out of default mode network. In fact, there are many, many psychiatric problems that have a problem with this. In fact, underlines, I would say, probably the majority of the things in our DSM have a result with over overexpression of default mode network. So yeah, absolutely, and that's kind of the point of the talk, <laughs> is that when it's when it's overexpressed, um, it becomes rigid, it becomes inflexible, and people get stuck in negative thinking, and they're let, letting their minds wander in bad neighborhoods. And what happens if you wander in bad neighborhoods? I had a patient the other day who has some memory problems, and one day she woke up and she found herself behind the wheel in Detroit and didn't have any idea how she got there. That's, called, that's a bad neighborhood, <laughs> okay? You don't want to, you know, wandering in bad neighborhoods is bad for you because bad things happen there. All right. Now, um, something called cognitive inflexibility. What happens here, as I mentioned, is that when you uh, do task positive, when, like the, the, uh, the default mode network is a task negative network. The other ones are task positive. In other words, you specifically direct your activity to do something. And when you do that, you turn off the default mode network. People who have chronic pain issues, chronic, if you have chronic pain, the more you do default mode network, the worse the pain becomes. Now, why would that, why would that be? If you think about the areas that were active, okay, it's all about you where you're constantly asking yourself, how do I feel? How do I feel? If you've got some pain and you go, I hurt, oh, oh, I hurt, and then you reflect on that. And if you, if you do not have goal-directed activity, your mind goes to your uwa and you just think about it over and over again, and it makes the perception of the pain worse. And when we look at the brains of people who have chronic pain, what we see is hyperconnectivity of the default mode network. What does hyperconnectivity look like? Well, these, these connections between these areas are thicker in those people. So if you look at the number of white matter uh, tracks, the, 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 you look, look, think, look at your cable. Okay. All right. So, so let's say this is a normal person's cable connecting the inferior parietal to the medial temporal. Now, here's somebody who has chronic pain issues. Okay. So you've got m the electricity is flowing much stronger between these areas. And this is what we see in people who have issues where you have chronic pain or you have somebody who's, the more, you, the, the more stuck you are in default mode, the stronger the connections become. 
Now, the question becomes, why did God do it that way? You know, the ne default mode network is kind of selfish and very negative. Why did God make it so that negative, scary, bad stuff gives you a stronger electrical signal than the positive stuff? Okay, why? Well, again, he's pro-life. He wants us to live. He wants us to be protected. Imagine, if you will, you're walking in the woods, haven't eaten in two days, very hungry, looking for something to eat, and you come across an abandoned campsite with a pizza and some chicken cooking, okay? And it's like, when you see that, you smell it, and you come across it, suddenly you're in a happy mood. Suddenly you've got endorphins rushing in your brain, and dopamine is being released at the nucleus accumbens, and you're feeling very positive here. Yahoo, my, 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 you know, I'm, I'm saved. Thank you, Jesus, for this pizza, right? And then you see somebody else hasn't eaten in two days, and they're coming up on you. Now, what the question is, Looking at your brain, what is going to give you a, a bigger electrical response? The bear or the pizza? Yeah, the bear. Yeah, you don't have to think twice about that. The bear takes precedence, and that's because God designed it that way. Self-preservation outranks. There is no positive thing. There is nothing so positive um, that is going to override that, okay, because that's a, that's a threat to your existence, okay? And so negative outweighs positive. And for thousands of years, we've lived in some pretty dangerous environments. If you take a look at people even today who live in very um, you know, primitive settings, uh, they live in danger of, of, of nature. They have a high mortality rates from all kinds of things, um, from tribes attacking one another, from wild animals, and so forth. And so it, in, for, in order for us to survive, we need to pay attention. Don't eat any more berries like that because you know, my whole family died when they ate that. And you know, we need to remember, stay away from those guys, OK? Or don't eat those mushrooms. Or stay away from, don't pet those things. They spray, they spray stinky stuff. You know, and you want to you remember that, OK? And so that keeps you from harm. So there is a reason why negative outweighs positive. But now we live in this industrialized country, and we don't have a lot of those threats. But those, those, those networks are still in play. Now, the issue of being idle, um, you know, not spilt, spent or filled with activity, lazy, vain, not in use or operation, doing nothing, habitually avoiding work, not working or active, indolent, frivolous, you know, all descriptions of what it means to be, uh, to be idle. Okay. Now, we have some, some, some scripture regarding this particular state of mind. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 27, says, Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle lips are his mouthpiece. Okay? Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle lips are his mouthpiece. Now, we have a proverb in the English world says, Idle minds are the devil's workshop. Or, idle minds are the devil's playground. That's not in the Bible, though. It says idle hands are the devil's workshop. But most Christians accept this proverb as downright spiritual. Can you derive, from, from the Bible, can you derive idle minds are the devil's playground from idle hands are the devil's playground or from other verses? Any, any feedback on that? Can you think of any verses that would, that would support this particular proverb? Mm -hmm. it can get filled with anything. Okay, if you let your mind wander, it can get filled with anything, and the Bible does talk us to specifically direct our thoughts to things that are positive, okay? It, it does more say to be busy with your hands. It, it does say that in other places, but mm -hmm. also uh, from what uh, Doug said, uh, Paul somewhere <laughs> said, uh, if anything's good or this or that or the other, that list, Think, think on these things. Yeah, Philippians it's, chapter 4. It's one thing, but I still yeah. think there's a heavy, uh, I mean, he says if those don't work, don't let them eat, you know, you know to, to be busy with producing something. Okay. <laughs> Not an actual yeah. product so much, but something. Okay, okay, all right. If, you, if, you, if those who don't work don't eat, okay, so that would definitely say something against being idle, okay, you'd think that. All right, all right. Jesus said, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. 
Okay, every idle word you speak, and you think about, you know, there's another verse that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if something's coming out of your mouth, it didn't start there. That started in your heart. Okay, anything that comes out of your mouth, it started in your mind first. Question, where is that verse in? Which what verse? The one that you got in there. It's in the New Testament. I forgot where. I didn't write the, I didn't write the reference down. I can get it real easy, but I, I, don't, I don't have it. I don't have it right now. Just, sorry about that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's in the Gospels. Yeah, it's not in my mind right now. <laughs> okay. All right. But you know, the thing is, is that um, if, 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 it, if, it came, if it came out of our lips, it was in our mind first. And so an idle mind, you know, basically idle words come from an idle mind. And so, yeah, you could, you could derive that. An idle mind is a place, is the, the devil's workshop in that particular regard. All right. When we redirect our thoughts to something specific, it turns off the idle network. It turns off default mode network. Now, in 2 Thessalonians 3.11, Paul says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, is it saying that everybody who's not working is a busybody? No, no. But some of you who are not working are busybodies. And I, that is something that is repeated in the New Testament, that people who don't have anything to do are more at risk for becoming busybody. What's a busybody? Gossip. Gossip, okay, so they tend to talk about other people's business, okay? What characterizes a busybody? But gossip, I think, does. That would be the, the, the typical saying, yes. Nosiness. Nosiness. Focusing their attention on things that are none of their business. All right. And when somebody is, again, if we don't have sufficient amount of activity, then default mode network is active. And the more active it becomes, the stronger those connections become. And where would nosiness come in? Nosiness comes in because what's going on is we're thinking about things that bother us and we're, think and we're comparing ourselves. And when you see something in the environment that somebody else is doing and you compare them to you, if they don't meet your standards, then it bothers you because you're always asking, how do I feel about that? And you're comparing yourself. And then you're looking for potential threats. Oh my gosh, if they don't rake their leaves today, then tomorrow there'll be twice as much leaves. And I don't want to have to look at that. Okay? And focusing on things that are really not their concern. Um, you know, one of the things that, 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 that made me want to go ahead and put this particular talk together is there is a, a friend of mine I had a, um, one of those neighborhood meetings, those uh, association, you know, those condominium association meetings. And one of the women there, was really upset and she was to the point where she was criticizing everybody and losing friends because there was a dead tree in the neighborhood and the association paid to have the tree cut down and they took it and they put it in the woods okay now which is okay right okay they got rid of it put it in the woods but when she looked out of her backyard window she could see the tree and that really bothered her because when she looked out her backyard window in the woods, there was a dead tree. And she insisted she wanted that thing chipped up, okay, so that she could, didn't have to see it. Now, <laughs> she was willing to damage relationships to get this tree gone. Now, the first thing that comes to mind and uh, the, uh, the first thing that came to everybody in the group's mind was get uh, life, okay. You have really you have to, you have time to sit around and worry about a dead tree in the forest. That's what a forest is. That's what woods are. Woods are dead and living trees. <laughs> you don't just have living trees. And it was find me a woods that doesn't have dead trees. I mean that's what they are by definition, okay. But she was bothered by it because she had too much time on her hands. Another woman was very upset because a neighbor had colored the, 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 the trim around the door before it was white. They changed the color to beige. And she was ready to break fellowship over that. She was ready to write a letter to the owner and really come down on him for changing the color of the trim on the door to beige from white. It just wasn't right. Okay, until her daughter told her she was being petty. And then she backed up. And then a week later, that same neighbor brought her flowers, you know, and she was so glad she didn't do it. But she'd been planning on doing it, okay? But it's petulance. And one of the things that gives rise to petulance is excess default mode network. Default mode network makes us compare ourselves. It makes us petty. 
It makes us constantly think about what's bothering me. What's bothering me now? What's bothering me now? How do I feel about you? How do you compare with me? Okay? And if you don't measure up to my standards, I'm bothered by it. So you can see excess default mode activation leads to petulance in a very big way. Now, how do animals decide what to do next? Okay, when animals sitting around thinking, you know, what decides, how, what, what, how do, an, what influences animal decisions? Because they are somewhat, you know, we, we have a lot in common with them, okay? Well, for animals, their sensors are active, taken in data from the environment, and they have needs when the needs give rise to drives, the hunger drive, sex drive, whatever, and they have sensations. And so, based on how strong their drives are, that determines how much they value something. Okay, how much do I value that banana? Depends how hungry I am, okay? That, that there's a, you know, a, kind of a green banana sitting there and I'm not hungry, that's a zero out of 10. But the hungrier I get, the more valuable that banana becomes, okay? That's how animals just choose. Their drives determine how valuable something is and once it, it reaches a certain value, we make the goal to get it. Okay, I need to walk across the road and get that banana. Okay, and then I'm going to plan to peel it, and then I'm going to eat it. That's my action. Okay, and so our drives determine our actions and behaviors. That's how animals work. And for humans, that's how we spend a lot of time as well. Okay, now the central problem for an animal is the five W's and the H, or the four W's and the H. What do I need? Why do I need it? Where do I get it? When can I get it? And how do I get it? Let's say, for example, chimpanzees, if they get hungry for meat, they hunt down monkeys, okay? And they form a group together, and if they're all hungry, they coordinate their effort, and they hunt down that monkey and eat the monkey. So their, 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 their drives, their, their appetites control their behaviors. Now, for humans, God has put us in a special class. He grooms us to be supernatural in the choices that we make in that instead of just being directed by our internal drives, which are organically based, based on our bodies, he has given us commands, things to do with our mind, choices. He has given us goal-directed thoughts. So instead of sitting around being in default mode, he expects us to be monitoring our thoughts and to switch off default mode and to replace default mode with specific thoughts. For example, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So one of the things that we do when we're in default mode is remember what we have to be thankful for and thank God for them. If we can see, if we can see in color, with two eyes, if we can hear, I mean, there are all kinds of things we have to be thankful for. Do we have a roof? Do we have food? Blah, blah, blah. You know, there's many things, and he expects us to engage our minds in thankfulness. Um, Psalm 26, 3, uh, David says, For I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. What did God do for you in the past? How has he demonstrated love for you already? Reflect on the sacrifices that he's made and the love that he has for us. And then it's first, uh, 2 Peter 3, 2, that you should recall the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior given through your apostles. In other words, what scripture has God communicated to us? I mean, what have we been reading? What, what are the truths of the Bible that he wants us to think about? And then what we talked about earlier, Philippians 4, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence and is honorable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there is any virtue and excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. Fix your minds on these. So when we find ourselves in default mode, we have commands in scripture about what to do with our thoughts. They are to be redirected and in redirecting it, it transforms our character. People who allow default mode to run, the, to run, to, to run amok become gossipy, they become anxious, they become depressed, okay? And they are, it, it, God, this is really weird. This is, I'm telling you, I, I wanna focus. I wanna focus on something. This is supernatural. What is natural is for our actions and behaviors to be determined by our biological drives, by our, not just our, our organic drives, but as humans, we have other drives. The need for love and belonging, for purpose, for respect, and all that, and for freedom and stuff, and pleasure. 
Okay, and so those are other drives that we have that make us value things and pursue things. Independent of our psychological and biological drives, God has this spiritual stuff. And he says, look, I want you to, with your will, do this. And so that in doing that, the more I do that, the more I think about what I'm supposed to be doing, the more I value pleasing God. Okay? And as I grow as a Christian, the value I place on pleasing God should go up. And as it does, it impacts my goals, my plans, and my actions. Okay? And it turns off default mode network. Okay? It turns it off. All right, now, 1 Timothy 5. And this is all of that is to discuss this particular verse. Because first time I read this particular one, I thought, you know, boy, that seems, I don't know, it made me a little uncomfortable the first time I read it. But in light of what we just read about default mode network, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I'm just going to go through it real quick here. This is specifically about who the church should support. I mean, like, there's, you know, some, some people in the church, I mean, the, the early church was very famous for giving out money, by the way. They were. And in fact, I, I'm one of the last, the last emperor, the emperor before um, uh, um, uh, Constantine, um, he, was very, he was very upset because it was obvious that paganism was dead. And there's so many Christians. And he, he made the comment. He says, you know, we can't compete. We can't compete. He says that these Christians, they support each other. He says they give money even to people who aren't even Christians. Okay. And he says that, you know, we don't, somebody's poor or whatever, we don't do anything for them and they help everybody. We don't, we don't have a chance. And then he was the last, the last pagan emperor of Rome. But he recognized the generosity of Christians is one of the reasons it was spreading so fast. And so the Christi Christianity has, has been famous for that from the beginning. But, um, you know, the thing is, is that Paul, or, or, yeah, or Paul was saying right here, he says, okay, when we support people, when you, when you give people a paycheck, you know, just to support them, make sure that they qualify. And he, he made some qualifications here, specifically regarding widows. Because remember, widows and orphans, the church was very much involved with widows and orphans. People who had no means to support themselves, the church was, was very good at supporting them, okay? But he says, okay, be careful on the type of widow that you support. He says this, take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God. So, if they're a widow and they have kids... Really, it's their kids' responsibility. So the church should not support them, you know, because really it's their kids' moral obligation to take care of them. So that's the first thing he says. Now, a true widow, a widow who is truly alone in this world, has placed her hope in God. She prays night and day, asking God for his help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead even while she lives. Give these instructions to the church so that no one will be open to criticism. But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. So it says, you know, only, only support them if they don't have family to support them. And so he, he anticipates the question, well, what if they have kids but they're not supporting them? And Paul's going, what? Not supporting their parents? Oh, my goodness. That's, not, that's unheard of. And it's like, you've got to be kidding. That's worse than unbelievers. It's like, geez. It's like, what? what? So he doesn't really answer the question. He's like, whoa, no way. You, they can't do that. That's, that's like worse than being a, how could, he's, like, he's, he's having a hard time imagining children that won't support their, their mom here. Okay? All right. A widow who is put on the list for support must be a woman who is at least 60 years old and was faithful to her husband. She must be well respected by everyone because of the good she has done. Has she brought up her children well? Has she been kind to strangers and served other believers humbly? Has she helped those who are in trouble? Has she always been ready to do good? So he's looking for evidence. Is she really a believer? Okay, one thing, be careful, because just because you're going into a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking into a garage makes you a car. OK, and he wants to make sure if you're going to support somebody, make sure there's fruit from their life. This is really a believer that you're supporting. OK, the younger widows should not be put on the list because their physical desires will overpower their devotion to Christ and they will want to remarry. Then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. And if they are on the list, they will learn to be lazy and will spend their time gossiping from house to house, meddling in other people's business and talking about things they shouldn't. 
So the, the, the desire for evolving into a busybody is going to be there. If they, don't, if they haven't demonstrated spiritual maturity in the past, if they're, if they're younger and prone to that, so then be careful because this is, this is a possible thing that can happen. So I advise these younger woodies to marry again, have children, and take care of their own homes. Then the enemy will not be able to say anything against them. For I am afraid that some have already gone astray and now follow Satan. If a woman who is a believer has relatives who are widows, she must take care of them and not put the responsibility on the church. Then the church can care for widows who are truly alone. And so here, Paul is basically taking a look at this, at this whole, he brings up this issue again. What happens if you have nothing to do and you take somebody like that who's not even demonstrated that they have spiritual maturity and you support them so they have nothing to do, they can evolve into busybodies. And it sounds like this had already happened in the church of Thessalonica, that they had women in the church that they were supporting who were going around being busybodies. And he says they need, they need some goal-directed activity here. Okay, and the whole point of kind of this presentation was to give you, I give, give, give you a mechanism by which to understand indolence or being lazy or not having anything to do supports default mode network activity and gossiping, comparing people, comparing ourselves to other people, and thinking about what's wrong in our lives happens when we overexpress default mode network. The more you are focusing your, your, your mind on activity, the less the default mode is active. Okay. All right, any questions? Okay, now I'm going to test you on the various parts of the brain. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> uh -oh. Is that an essay test? Yeah. Essay test, yes. <laughs> about multiple choice tests. Multiple choice tests, yes. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. what's that? Those are hard. Those are hard. <laughs> multiple choice? <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about when you were talking about the idle mind. Yeah. Negative, self-focused, yeah. Exactly. Um, however, if you were to focus on the fruits of the spirit, or you know, mm -hmm. uh, if you were actually, let me go back. If you were to go into scripture and read scripture, that will redefine your thinking. And it will become the mind of Christ. Therefore, anything that should come out of your mouth, things that you do, will be changed because you are being changed within. Yeah. Yeah. By the Holy Spirit's presence guiding you through Scripture. Absolutely, it's very, it's it's transformative by multiple mechanisms. That's absolutely right. By directing your attention, just by directing your attention to Scripture, you're turning off default mode, and then when you're you're, you're putting it on something that strengthens you spiritually. Okay, so yeah, I mean it it it, it is transformative. I really believe that even when you're going through a time of stress, a stressful time. You have anxiety, you have fears, mm -hmm. you have worries and that. If I have found in myself, if I can go into Scripture and stay steadfast into Scripture, those fears, the anxiety, etc., they, they, they dissipate. They, you're, you know, that mechanism works very well. And the, the problem is for people who have grown up just swimming in default mode every day, um, it's difficult for them because their brains, the, the connections have become so thick that this is something you have to remind them of over and over and over again because it's so easy for them to lapse into that default, okay? Because that is, it's natural. It's natural. And what you're describing is unnatural, and that's why we need God's help. This is where, you know, when we find ourselves in that negativity where we constantly, your mind wants to wander and follow the path of least, least, least resistance. Okay, I mean, I've got I've got 40 percent of the energy of my brain is devoted to default mode. It's very easy to turn that on. It's work to, to redirect my attention. But God will help us. It's his will that we do it. And if we turn to him and say, Lord, help me do this. Help me focus on thankfulness. Help me focus on you. Help me read scripture and remember what you promised. He will. But it, it, they have to do it. They have to choose to do it. And if, they, if it's not natural, then we pray that it become more natural until it becomes that way. But you're absolutely right. It does work. It works every time. Yeah? I've heard, too, that anything you do for, I think, 20 days or 24 days becomes a habit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you, if you do it, yeah, the more you do it, the more entrained those pathways become. 
neurons that wire together fire together, you know, and so, yeah, and that's what you're doing. I said it backwards. It's, it's fire together, wire together. But bottom line is that the more you do a particular habit, the, the stronger the pathways become ingrained in your brain. And you can redirect that energy away from default to something that is goal-directed. Okay.